and they were blue ones and red ones and pink ones and light blue ones. And so the variables that were used to describe the world and what was going on in the world of interest were in accord with this ideological competition. But beginning in 1970 with the first Earth Day and the environmental movement and the Club of Rome models, we started writing maps of the world that were green and blue and brown and yellow and they showed population and so forth. So it was a change in the game. Uh, we were playing a different game. And once again, if you estimate the number of people involved in the Club of Rome studies, say about a dozen, and the number of people on the planet at the time, which I think was three, maybe four billion, then you have once again an amplification of about a factor of a thousand. So how do you cope with complexity? When you're faced with complexity, you have two choices. You can either increase the variety in the regulator by hiring staff, hiring a contractor, buying a computer, or you can reduce the variety in the system being regulated by reducing the variety that you choose to control. In other words, you say, well, I'm not going to require everybody to wear a tie to work, uh, or we're not going to have a dress code, uh, and so we don't have to worry about that anymore. You can control by, you, you can cope with complexity by reducing your aspirations. If you try to control less, there's less tension. Uh, my wife and I had this debate on how to deal with the children. Uh, I have a very relaxed attitude toward the children. If, if they're not hurting each other, and if they're not hurting the furniture in the house, let them do whatever they want. But she has higher aspirations. She wants them to play in this area of this room with this toy in this way. And of course the kid puts it in its mouth or something like that. And she gets very tense. <laughs> and I say, just relax your aspirations. Don't try to control so much and uh, you won't be so tense. All right. There, there's another variation on this, uh, and that is that customer satisfaction is equal to performance uh, minus expectations. And what that means is if you want to increase your customer satisfaction, you can either improve your performance or reduce the prior expectations. Uh, so if you're trying to increase product quality in a corporation, focus your effort on improving your performance, not telling your customers that you're a high quality producer. If you tell your customers you're a high quality producer, they'll come in with high expectations. And even if you are a high quality producer, they're not going to be as satisfied. Okay. All right, so let's move on then to self-organization. Are there any questions up to now on regulation, the law of requisite variety? The law of requisite variety, I believe, is extremely important because it states a quantitative relationship between information and decision making. And yet it's almost unknown. In the management field, very few people have ever heard of the law of requisite variety. But it's been around since the early 50s. And I find that puzzling. But uh, it's, it's part of the puzzle of cybernetics. Cybernetics is a, is a terrific field, in my opinion, and very few people know about it. So see, you guys are in on the, the, on the inside now. You've got this special knowledge that is not widely known. All right, <clears throat> let's talk about self-organization. 
standardization, because this is where the notion of complex adaptive systems uh, comes from, I think, uh, or at least the notion of complexity as it's greatly talked about these days. Where did the idea originate? Well, the first paper that I think could be related to this would be Ashby's paper during the Macy conferences, which was around 1950, in which he asked the question, this is the title of the paper, can a mechanical chess player outplay its designer? And they didn't know at the time. Okay, nowadays it's pretty easy to answer that question. Um, but at the time, they really didn't know. And so the issue was, how do we formulate this issue such that we can answer this question? And Ashby's answer uh, was, yes. A mechanical chess player can outplay its designer if it can learn from sources other than the designer. All right? I mean, this is like a student in a university. Uh, we routinely expect students to outperform their professors. That's the whole idea. Otherwise, knowledge would not progress. Well, how is that possible? It's very simple. They have more than one professor. And they have books, libraries, journals, so that you can learn from multiple sources and put things together in ways that they've never been put together before. But that gets back to the split between artificial intelligence and cybernetics, that the artificial intelligence people chose the route where the designer determined the behavior of the machine. And the cyberneticians chose the route where the machine or the artificial intelligence device could learn from sources other than just the designer. And that led to the notion of self-organization, of the um, organism or the machine adapting to its environment. All right, so von Forster said, let's get rid of the notion of self-organizing systems because organisms learn in cooperation with their environment. In this article, Self-Organizing Systems and Their Environments, um, von Forster presented three thought experiments, three Gedanken experiments, uh, which have been highly influential within the field among those who know them. Uh, it's a very simple uh, case. Let's imagine you have a box about this big. And you have some ping pong balls. Everybody knows what a ping pong ball is. And you have some cubes that are approximately the same size as the ping pong balls. You also have a sheet of magnetic material. Think of a piece of cardboard. On one face, you have positives. And on the other face, you have negatives. Then you cut up the sheet of magnetic material into squares that are the same size as the faces of the cubes. Now we're going to do three experiments. And the first one, on every cube, we stick a piece of this magnetic material so that the positive is facing out. Okay, so on every cube, on all six faces, you have positives facing out. And you put these cubes into the box along with about an equal number of ping pong balls and you shake up the box. Shaking the box is an input of energy. Okay, shake up the box. Open the box and what do you see? How are the cu cubes arranged? Uh, yeah, they're basically, they, they repel each other. Okay, so they're largely equally distributed within the box. Okay, second experiment. Of the six faces, three are positive out and three are negative out on every cube. You put the cubes back in the box, shake up the box, and what do you see this time? They're all glommed together because they attract. The positives and negatives match up. So you get this one big bunch. Okay, third experiment. 
On each cube, you have five sides that are positive and one side that's negative. On every cube, you put them back in the box, shake up the box, open up the box, and what do you see? Anybody want to say? Well, mostly they repel each other, right? But they also have an ability to match up on one face. So you may get something that looks like this, but this would be in three dimensions. Okay, you get something that resembles a long chain molecule. Now, if you remember your chemistry, covalent bonds and other kinds of bonds, you know that that's the way atoms come together. They fill in the missing electrons in orbit. So water is H2O, and uh, organic molecules are combinations of hydrogen and carbon. So in this case, the thought experiment of the magnetic cubes in the box. You have three experiments, three different outcomes. In two cases, the results are interesting. And in one case, uh, this, in two cases, the results are uninteresting. In one case, the results are interesting from a human point of view. But from the point of view of the cubes, that's, they're identical. They're just going towards stable equilibrium. Now, during each experiment, the interaction rules did not change. Okay, so you could say that the box was informationally closed. So you have an informationally closed system, but energy flowing through it, that was the shaking of the box, and the elements within the box went toward their stable equilibrial states, thereby organizing themselves. Now this was a major reinterpretation within the scientific community. Because previously, the guiding or the most common conception was that of the second law of thermodynamics from physics, in chemistry, I guess, which was that isolated systems go toward unavailable energy. That is, they lose order. There are differences between the physics conception and this conception because the physics conception focuses on energy. Uh, this, this one is a combination of energy and information. I'll, I'll go over that in a minute. But the notion was that the natural process in nature was for order to decline. And so the mystery was how does order arise? How do we explain emergence? How do we explain the evolution of complexity? And Ashby said that in any system, you have stable equilibrial states and unstable states. The system will tend to go toward the stable equilibrial states, thereby selecting, hence organizing itself. So every system, as it goes toward the equilibrium, organizes itself. It's just that sometimes the results are uninteresting and sometimes the results are interesting. But every system is going toward its stable equilibrial states. So this was a major advance over previous conceptions about how order arises in the universe. And you can say that the concept of self-organization uh, is a larger theory that subsumes Darwin's theory of natural selection, uh, competition in an economic system, learning theory, and so forth. And I'll give you examples of those as we go. So von Forster called this thought experiment order from noise, because the box is open to energy, the box is closed to information in terms of interaction rules, 
and order appears.